Hello, welcome to China Tonight. I'm Stan Grant. On the program, lying flat, how China's youth are saying no to long hours. Why campaigning for LGBTIQ rights upsets the government? And China's critical role in the next phase for Afghanistan. But first, what's making news on the platforms that the Chinese people themselves use, both on the mainland and across the world? Yvonne Yong joins me now. Hi, Yvonne. Hi, Stan. As America marks the 20th anniversary of the September 11 attacks, an article by Chinese opinion writer Guan Ling caught the public's attention. He wrote that the decision of then-President Jiang Zemin to call President Bush within hours of the attack to offer condolences and condemn terrorism had a huge impact on the development of Sino-US relations in the following years. Cooperation brings success, the world will be at peace, agreed this netizen. But also, China has indeed risen up, but America is not going downwards. China on many fronts is still left behind. Stan. Yes, Yvonne, and we're going to talk more about how the resulting war in Afghanistan continues to test that relationship. And there's also been a big development on one of the stories that caused a stir in China earlier this year. Last time we were on air, Angarad Yeo looked at the popularity and perils of gaming in China. 2019, the CCP was so worried about kids getting addicted to games that they installed a curfew. Using what I can only imagine is just a big old switch on someone's desk that says no more fun on it, the curfew cuts off video games for people under 18 between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. every day. Angara Yo joins me now. So what's happened since the last time we spoke? Well, China has doubled down. And now if you're under the age of 18, you can only game for three hours a week between the times of 8 and 9 p.m. from Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, well, one hour and only certain days. How on earth do you ever try to police something like that? Well, China has put the onus back on the gaming companies. So obviously that's going to mean that everybody enforces it in a slightly different way. But using login credentials that have to be verified against official IDs is a really common one. Um, and Tencent, which is one of the largest gaming companies, they do a lot of online games, including League of Legends, and they're very big in China. Uh, they are also going to be using facial recognition software. So tell me about these games and whether you can even get one finished in that allotted time. Look, it really depends on the game, but I'm going to say more than often not. You know, you've got the time just going through the menus and then also searching for a game. And often a match can go for somewhere in the realm of like 50 minutes minimum. So I think a lot of people will be hard pressed to get a good game in an hour. All right. Thank you, Red. Thank you again. Now, one of the biggest conversations online recently has been working hours. CCTV published a story on Weibo on overtime cases, and more than 420 million people viewed the hashtag Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security and the Supreme Court clarify 996 and 007 are illegal after the Supreme People's Court and Ministry of Human Resources made public statements critical of illegal overtime pressure. Yvonne, China's economic growth has come at a high cost to its workforce, but there's been a growing movement among young people to reject the so-called 996 culture. And it's creating another friction point between the state and many of its people. Annie Louie has this report. Meet Zhang Xinmin, who lives in China and quit his job in advertising five years ago. He now spends his time jamming on his guitar and writing songs like this one. But in China, you can't find this song anywhere on social media. He's been censored. His song is called Tang Ping Ji Zheng Yi, which translates to Lying Flat is King. And the Chinese government is not a fan. But what is so controversial about a well-deserved lie down? Well, this idea of lying flat is a protest. It encourages young people to take it easy, relax, and go against the rhetoric of working hard for your country. Personally, I don't need much convincing. I quit my nine to five job to become a comedian. I've been a master of lying flat since 2019. To understand why this movement is considered a threat to China's stability, we need to delve into the country's work culture. 
China's style of working can be summarized by the phrase Jiu Jiu Liu, which means 996. 996 simply refers to uh, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. per day on the six days per week. Uh, so it's quite an intensive working hours. Campaigners concerned for the well-being of citizens coined the count phrase, Jill Jill Lil, I see you, alluding to the fact being overworked could land you in hospital. It's a very fast paced environment. It's very high pressure. Mike Liu was raised in Melbourne, but now lives in the bustling city of Shanghai. In my role as an executive assistant, uh, I find that I need to be available to my boss at all times. He might still need me to do some work for him at maybe eight o'clock on a Sunday. And if I'm out, uh, maybe having dinner with friends, then I'll need to go back home and do work. The tech industry is especially bad. 996 is the spirit that I encourage in Alibaba people. Employers see working around the clock as vital to catch up with rivals in Silicon Valley. Flora Liu is all too familiar with the tech industry's grind culture. She works in human resources in Beijing. Currently, I'm working for a tech startup and the working culture here are, is intense, um, I'd say, because people want to, want to make the company grow and want to realize their dream. People are not coming here for, um, for a job. They're coming here to realize themselves. So tell me about the work ethic amongst young people. Is there any difference between the generations? Um, so I'm currently working with, I'd say Gen Y, Gen Z and Alpha generation. Uh, and I definitely see that comparing these three generations, I, Gen Y are definitely tend to work harder, uh, work longer hours. Well, Alpha generations they are more YOLO sometimes they are more laid back comparing with Gen Y. Some companies are now banning working on Sundays for better work-life balance. What impact do you think this might have on the Chinese economy? One of the things uh, that I saw is that the speed of economic growth is heavily related to how much people work here. Um, and the people are always trying to push through things uh, to get that growth. And with this, policy being cancelled or like people start to work less, economic growth would slow down, uh, in my opinion. But on the, on the other hand, the, the, the levels of happiness might grow. Tumble out of bed and I stumble to the kitchen, pour myself a cup of ambition and yawn and stretch and try to come to life. But all this high pressure can come at a cost. Uh, you meet a lot of successful people in Shanghai who um, don't have other parts of their lives or have neglected other parts of their lives. They don't have time to uh, date around or to start a family. Um, it's just become part of them. Oh, and the lying flat doctrine isn't just about chilling out and not giving everything to the corporate grind. In a country where people are already putting off having children, young people are now creating viral memes saying, don't buy a house, don't buy a car, don't have a baby and don't consume. I think maybe it, it does require time for, for the giant tech companies to be more mature, to have a more, uh, maybe more creative approach, not just the overwork. Overwork is not the only solution, and probably it's not even the best solution to increase productivity. I know which side I'm on. Working nine to five, what a way to make a living. It's enough to drive you crazy if you let it. Now, as we've mentioned, China's government has been busy in recent months enforcing social change, crackdowns on social media, bans on private tutoring, cancelling celebrities, and the LGBTIQ movement is no exception. Is it homophobia, a fear of activism of any sort, or a combination of both? Jinghua Chan takes a look. For more than a century, students in China have been leading the charge for all sorts of causes like anti-imperialism, democracy, and civil rights. And in recent years, student-led groups have become the backbone of the country's queer community. 
For young people questioning their gender or sexuality, campus clubs are often their first port of call. They're also an entry point into activism. For LGBTQ activism, you usually need volunteers, enthusiastic volunteers, and students and young people are really core central forces in activism. So they are passionate about their identities and politics. They also have time and they're not afraid of different risks. Dr. Hongwei Bao grew up in China, did his PhD in Sydney, and now teaches queer theory and China studies in the UK. He says LGBTIQ student groups started to emerge in China in the 90s, especially after 1995, when Beijing hosted the UN World Conference on Women. The conference marked the birth of the NGO sector, and it also brought lesbian feminists from all over the world to China. Since then, student activists have shown that they're smart, powerful and strategic. They've gotten organised, staging plays and film festivals. They've even sued the Ministry of Education. The visibility of the queer community has been much greater, which is great. Um, but on the flip side, there are more ideological conflicts between heterosexual and non-heterosexual communities. There's been a backlash. A couple of months ago, WeChat shut down dozens of pages run by queer campus groups. The sweep affected clubs at Peking University, Fudan, and even international schools like the University of Nottingham, Ningbo. And now, news is emerging that academics at Shanghai University have been told to identify LGBT students and report on their ideological and psychological status. It's pretty worrying. So I get why people put on their sad, serious face when they ask what it's like to be queer in China. They assume it's awful. But actually, when I lived there, I had a really good time. I went to a trans conference in Ningbo, a drag show in Hangzhou, and a lesbian skate rink in Shanghai. I even managed to find a queer cafe in Urumqi. The way of doing LGBTIQ community work in China that people used in the past may not be applicable in today. The work that involves policy advocacy and rights awareness would be harder because of the censorship of media. The thing is, homophobia in China hits different. There aren't really any religious lobbies and there aren't laws explicitly targeting LGBTIQ communities. Most of the time these groups get harassed by the authorities, it's because they're seen as a political threat. In recent years in China, there has been a crackdown on civil society organizations and different sorts of social and political activism. At the same time, there's also an intensified sense of nationalism and patriotism. So a lot of things can be artificially divided into a kind of Chinese or non-Chinese or Chinese or Western lines. As a result, Chinese activists have been accused of being puppets of the West. It's tricky for the international community to support Chinese queers without triggering nationalist backlash. And of course, you have to recognize that uh, this is in a way a false dichotomy because homosexuality, for example, has been in existence in Chinese history for hundreds of years. I think that we need to think about things in a more cosmopolitan way. Um, first, to understand China's history of its diverse genders and sexualities. And second, to see China as a part of the world where international practices are already deeply embedded. I could really feel the impact of all these crackdowns. So many people I wanted to interview for this story were wary of talking to the ABC. It made me question doing this segment and even this show when publicity in Western media doesn't really help Chinese activists. But I still wanted to show you that there is a queer movement in China. It's passionate and resilient and I hope to see it trial. And Jinghua Chan joins us now. Jinghua, when you look at the LGBTIQ community, what other changes have you noticed in recent years? 
Yeah, I think for me it does seem that there is increased hostility from some parts of government towards the LGBTIQ community uh, and it also feels as though there's a diminishing space for queer and trans representation in Chinese media. Uh, when I moved to China five years ago, uh, a trans woman, Jingxing, was one of the biggest TV stars with her own talk show, um, with really high ratings. Her face was on billboards, you know, in the subway. Uh, her show got cancelled. Um, this, that same year, Shanghai Pride was, you know, in its eighth year with a huge week-long festival. Um, that's since shut down just last year. Uh, and I think China Media, uh, China Rainbow Media Awards, an organisation that does uh, media monitoring, has also found that the number of LGBTIQ stories in mainstream media in China has also dropped um, over the last few years. I think 2020 was the, mm. the smallest number of stories since uh, 2013. So it does feel like there is a, a silence, I mm. suppose. Jinghua, your story makes it very clear that there's a connection here or a concern about activism. I'm just wondering whether any of the homophobic backlash is connected to a population crisis as well. Yeah, I think a, a, a lot of people have posited that, that the um, government under Xi Jinping is, you know, focused on um, boosting marriage and families and, um, and fertility. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's important to recognise that, you know, that's a political choice to, I guess, um, endorse heterosexual marriage as the, you know, the only kind of um, family um, in which, you know, uh, children are welcomed. There could equally be uh, a move to support single parents and uh, same-sex families, um, but that's not the case. So I think I want to emphasise that that's not an in inevitable mm. response, I suppose, to a fertility crisis. Yeah, fascinating story, Jinghua. Thank you again. Great. Thanks, Dan. Chinese leader Xi Jinping took a call from US President Joe Biden last week, only their second since Mr Biden took office. China and the United States have been locked in a standoff across a range of issues, including trade, technology and human rights and the origins of COVID-19. The call, initiated by the US, is being seen as an attempt to coax China into more substantive engagement as lower level talks stall. This call was about uh, keeping the channels of communication open. Uh, and what we've seen is uh, that the importance here is about engaging Xi directly uh, at the leader level due to the centralization of power uh, and the power that's in his hands. White House said in a statement that Biden and Xi had a broad strategic discussion in which they discussed areas where our interests converge and areas where our interests, values and perspectives diverge. Beijing's statement largely mirrored Washington's but warned diminished cooperation between the two superpowers could bring disaster, saying the US-China relationship is not a multiple answer question of whether we should have good relations, but a compulsory question of how. And Yvonne, Peter Dutton got a dressing down at China's foreign ministry press conference late last week. He did stand. Defence Minister Peter Dutton didn't hold back in a speech he made to American business lobbyists last Wednesday, accusing Beijing of engaging in increasingly coercive behaviour and harbouring a zero-sum mentality, even comparing the behaviour of the Chinese government to the World War II build-up of the 1930s. But on Friday, China's foreign ministry hit back, calling Mr Dutton's remarks extremely dangerous and irresponsible. And the rebuke against Mr Dutton coincided with talks the Defence Minister held alongside Foreign Minister Maurice Payne in India last week, focusing on strengthening security ties. Yvonne, also in the news, China makes one of the first pledges of financial aid to the Taliban-run Afghanistan. Having scolded America for bailing out of the country, it's now under pressure as a near neighbour to exert some influence. To that end, following a meeting with other bordering countries, China pledged around $31 million in food, winter weather supplies and COVID-19 vaccines. But that's likely to be just the start. Not everyone left Afghanistan last month. Afghanistan is a 
，中阿两国是友好国家，中国不想损害阿富汗，阿富汗也不想损害中国。China has maintained a polite, if distant, relationship with Afghanistan historically. In recent years, there had been small steps to develop infrastructure projects and explore minerals. And while China evacuated many of its citizens from Afghanistan in August, it kept the consulate open with support from the Taliban. China shares only a tiny border with Afghanistan, some 90 kilometers. The Wakhan Corridor, a rocky frontier scrap of land, connects to the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. But while the border is small, the potential role of China in the next phase of Afghanistan could be huge. In July, a Taliban delegation paid a visit to Tianjin and met with China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi. China is a very important and strong country in our neighbourhood. We look forward to building a very strong relationship with China because China is a rapidly developing country which can support Afghanistan in the economic sector and we are hoping for Chinese investment and exports. China is also looking for support from the new regime. When the Taliban was last in charge back in the 90s, China called for a crackdown on Uyghur militants in the region, mostly those in the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, or Etim. It blames Etim for almost any terror attack on Chinese soil, using this to justify the ongoing crackdown in Xinjiang. When America wanted China's support in the war against terror, it agreed to list Etim as a terrorist organization. But last year, that was taken away again by the Trump administration as the two countries traded barbs. Now China wants reassurance from the Taliban that it won't provide Etim a safe haven. We also hope that the Taliban will be able to protect the Chinese government, including the Chinese government. While countries who have fought the Taliban for decades now have to rationalize leaving millions to their rule, China is publicly declaring its expectations of its neighbor before it makes any promises about their future relationship. Mr. President, are you worried that the Taliban will get funding from China? Well, China has a real problem with the Taliban, so they're going to try to work out some arrangement with the Taliban, I'm sure, as does Pakistan, as does Russia, as does Iran. They're all trying to figure out what do they do now. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Well, joining me now to discuss what China is likely to do in Afghanistan is Ahmed Rashid, a journalist who has written many books about the Taliban and terrorism. Ahmed, it's good to have you on the program. I, I want to get your sense of how China sees this moment and whether it sees it as an opportunity. Absolutely. I think the overall winner of this whole conflict has been China. China wants to exploit the minerals in Afghanistan, the oil, the gas, um, and it wants peace and stability to do that. Uh, we've already seen China's playing a major role in salvaging Pakistan, which faces a, a near bankruptcy. China has helped out with projects and with money for those projects. The, the problem with Afghanistan is China does not give aid as such. Mm. And the demand right now is humanitarian aid. And that's what the West is gearing up to give Afghanistan um, if they can find a compromise with the Taliban government. But China does not give that kind of aid. So we have to see if the Chinese are going to change their, their tactics um, in order to help the Afghans, mm. because the Afghans are desperate for, for aid. One of the really critical questions here, and I think it's facing the rest of the world, but particularly China, is just how close it gets to the Taliban. Are we likely to see recognition of the Taliban as a legitimate government in, in Afghanistan? You've already mentioned the economic opportunities. Just how close politically does China get to the, to the Taliban? China has been meeting with the Taliban for the last uh, three or four years. And at one point in the beginning, it did play a conciliatory role in trying to bring the Taliban together with the, um, uh, with, with the government. But that didn't work out. China stepped back for, for a time. And now it seems everything is playing into China's hand 
um, without China having to do very much. And uh, that is going to obviously cause resentment with the United States and with other uh, Western countries. One of the really critical things that everyone's watching right now is the response of all the neighbouring countries. And there's some fascinating geopolitical games being played. You mentioned Pakistan. China and Pakistan are very close and share an interest, don't they, in limiting India's potential to get a foothold in Afghanistan as well. Talk us through that power play. Well, one reason Pakistan has backed the Taliban for the last 20 years is because of what it fears is an Indian threat and the idea that India could become influential in Afghanistan and replace Pakistan. And that's the last thing that the, the Pakistanis want. China supports this position. I think what we'll see very quickly is a Chinese recognition of the Taliban government. Um, that probably will be followed by uh, three or four countries, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, China, uh, will probably be the first to recognize the Taliban government, uh, even before the West. Um, these countries don't have any qualms about human rights, women's rights, um, mm. education, or any of the social aspects. Uh, they find it much, much easier to recognize the Taliban and win uh, brownie points with the Taliban rather than uh, wait. They've already said that they're not going to mention the Uyghur problem. Mm. Um, that the, the Uyghurs are nothing to do with the Taliban, and we will um, uh, we will stay silent on that. But this was a public declaration made by the Taliban about three weeks ago, before they took Kabul, when they met with the Chinese foreign minister, and that's come as quite a shock to many Muslims because Uyghurs, of course, are Muslims and. Countries want uh, solidarity with the Uyghurs, uh, and clearly that's not going to be the case as far as the Taliban are concerned. The Taliban is one question, but of course there are other militant groups operating in the region, Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, Khorasan. I'm wondering, given you've raised the question of the Uyghurs, whether that becomes a problem for China, whether Uyghurs look for support amongst other militant groups or those other militant groups look at creating some opportunities now in China because of the crackdown on the Uyghurs by the Chinese? Yes, I agree with you. I mean, I, Ch China is very wary of all these groups. They've, they've suffered. Um, that there was an attack by uh, the Pakistani Taliban that killed nine Chinese just a, few, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, the Chinese engineers were killed. So uh, China is being trying to be extra cautious, um, and then China is not going to jump in immediately. They're going to wait until they see some kind of stability. Um, they are they are not risk risk takers in in any big way. Um, they're going to wait until uh, they see the situation evolve. But they will be one of the first to recognise the mm. Taliban. Just finally, Ahmed, um, it's a bit of a cliche, I know, but it's long been said that Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. And I want to reflect on this moment and the American pullout and what you believe it means for the future of American power. Well, I think it's been a huge blow to the image of America in the region. And I think it's going to spur on America's departure from South Asia and Central Asia. And the Americans are going to focus much more on the rivalry with China and East Asia. Uh, we are going to see a, a vacuum here, and this vacuum is likely to be filled by China in the sense of economics and politics and um, everything else. The Chinese have a huge advantage now, and um, it's been humiliating for the Americans uh, for, to be defeated by a sort of ragtag army like the Taliban and, um, and to be defeated twice in this region by the Afghans. And uh, the, the Afghan militants are very proud of that. Ahmed Rashid, it's always good to talk to you. Thank you again for giving us your time. Thank you very much. And that's all we have on this week's show. Next week, the impact of the government's decision to ban the mega business of academic tutoring. I'm Stan Grant. Have a great night.